for those that want to get into nursing, what's some advice you would give them? If you want to get into nursing, um, Mr. Barry Coleman on another edition of Understanding the Nursing Game podcast. I got a very, very, very special guest in the building today. But before I get to the guest, let's go to the quote of today. All right. <clears throat> Education is the passport to the future. For tomorrow belongs to those who pre- prepare for it today. Amen. All right. Hey, hey, hey. I'm going to read it again for the folks in the back of the church. Let them know. Hey, education is the passport to the future. For tomorrow belongs to those who prepare for it today. That's by the great, the late great Michael Mix. So, um, that, thanks for letting them know, Pastor. There you go. There you go. <laughs> hey, you, can, you can pass the collision plate now. Nah, hey, hey, go on five to choir. That's going to pass the collision tree. Yes, Lord. That's right. That's right. So, uh, to the special guest for today, uh, this fella right here. Hey, I'm be honest with you. I normally don't don't interview the fellas. I normally speak to the beautiful women in nursing, but this gonna be a change right here. We gonna get to hear from the fellas tonight. Hey, we got the Kevin, the boot nurse. How you doing today, man? Hey, man. I appreciate you having me. I like that intro. Hey, I'm all about you know being a first. Uh, you know, I know, I know that you, you interviewed the beautiful women in nursing, you know, now you get the beautiful, you know, handsome men in nursing, you know, letting them know what's happening, you know, in the nursing field and just in the world and just, you know, education, just, you know, just everything, man. So I appreciate you having me here. That's right. That's right. And it's important that, um, uh, that I venture out of my comfort zone because, um, somebody listened to this podcast, a male and, um, need a role model need okay. a role model so guess what uh you got two of them today facts so, hey y'all know where to, y'all know where to find us y'all know where to find right. us that's right all the fellas out there so uh hey man i'm gonna start it off like i do with everybody else mm-hmm. tell, tell everybody where you're from um i am originally from colleen texas you know a hey, shout out to the k um Anybody up there in Colleen? Hey, don't go visit Colleen. Uh, Cause ain't nothing up there. Uh, <laughs> I'm just keeping it real. But right now I live in uh, San Antonio, Texas. So Texas boy through and through. Okay. All right then. I actually had a homeboy that stayed in San Antonio. He said he liked it. He said he liked the uh, them, them Mexican women down there. Hey, they got uh okay. All right. You know what I'm saying? Hey, they got some, hey. The Latino, the you know, the Latinas around here, boy. Okay, hey, don't, and and don't let, don't let, don't let whatever they tell you about these Hispanic women down here, you know, like they they how they ugly or whatever. Hey, don't be, hey, don't be on that Charles Barkley. All right, don't be on that shit. All right, because they got some fine women down here. Okay, so I'm just saying, y'all ever come to San Antonio for like, you know, like any events or whatever? Hey, just you know, hey. And indulge in the local cuisine. I'm just saying. Okay, dude. Hey, that's good enough for me. That's what I'm saying. All right, there. Hey, man. Tell everybody how you got into nursing. Uh, well, like for me, um, my nursing journey has been almost the span of ten years. So I originally said back in 2012 that I want to be a nurse. I said it out loud to myself when I was working at surgical tech and one of my mentors who was going into a nursing program flat out said to me, Hey, if you want to be a nurse in the Navy, cause I was active duty in the Navy at this time, he said to me, if you want to be a nurse through the Navy, you need to go on a deployment. And I was like, okay. And this is when Iraq and Afghanistan was still on and popping. And sure enough, three weeks later, an opportunity came up for me to go on a deployment. So I went on a deployment to Afghanistan for a year. Um, this is probably going to sound funny the most, but that was probably the best experience of my life because it really put a lot of things into perspective about life, about culture, about other people's cultures and how, <clears throat> how the media kind of just, you know, it's very one-sided and it's, and, and also how the media is just very different depending on the region of the world that you live in. Um, and I had a lot of, a lot of great mentors 
from the enlisted to the officer side that knew what I wanted to do, that 100% fully supported me. And then once I came back in 2013, uh, I hit the ground running. Uh, I started going to school, started doing all my prereqs. Um, I had a couple of change of stations. You know, I moved from Florida to San Antonio um, and I became an instructor uh, and I was teaching surgical technology for about three and a half years while I was all, while I was still going to school, while I was still doing clinicals, while I was still doing all that. Um, and so I was a student while I was a teacher teaching students. So it was just a very, it was a, it was a, like a revolving cycle that was just happening. And one that I could really, really appreciate is because as I was teaching and I could see how frustrated my students were, I, as a student felt the frustration of trying to become a nurse. So <clears throat> it was a lot of things that I put in, into perspective. Um, while I was doing that, uh, I kind of had a hiccup because I had uh, applied for some officer programs. And for those that don't know is that when you're enlisted in the military, you can apply for officer programs to become a nurse or to become an officer of any type. Um, and I applied for three different programs, four different times, and I didn't get selected for any of them. Um, and then they were telling me, hey, you know, you're up for orders, you know, it's, you're, you have to go to a ship. And I'm just like, oh, Lord. I ain't trying to go to nobody's ship right now. <laughs> and so, um, you know, the, the, you know, black Jesus out there looking out for me. Um, and at some point somebody made a phone call <clears throat> because they realized that I was in the middle of nursing school at this point, I was already in my fourth semester of nursing school when they tried to send me to a ship. But so they took my orders away and gave them to somebody else. And then, so at that point, I'm kind of in limbo. Um, and then there <clears throat> was an opportunity for another teaching position still here in San Antonio. So I didn't have to move houses. I didn't have to do anything. I just literally went from one building to uh, further down the street to another building. Uh, I had a lot of great leadership and they knew I was at this point, I was in my last semester of nursing school. So when I got to my last command, I let them know uh, I was able to um, finesse um, a couple of things. I was able to finish my clinicals and finish nursing school. And then I graduated in 2018. Um, so that's, that's essentially like, you know, my nursing journey, um, in a nutshell in regards to school, but here's where the real big hiccup, uh, comes to play. I took my NCLEX October of 2018. So two months after I graduated, uh, and then I failed my NCLEX terribly. So I got 75 questions. This is when it was 75 questions. Um, and then you already know if you get 75 questions, like you blew it out of the water or you did really bad. And I can tell you right now that first one didn't do. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> um, so then, you know, I was like, I was real down about it, but then I was like, man, what did I do wrong? And, you know, hindsight's 2020. Now I look back and I realized there was a ton of things I was doing wrong. Um, I was using, you know, different um, nursing uh, NCLEX reviews, like the school provided board vitals. You know, you had the Saunders NCLEX book, you had UWorld out there. Uh, people, somebody had given me the Mark Clemick review. Uh, somebody had given me the Hearst review, so on and so forth. So fast forward, um, I end up going to the Mark Clemick review in Houston, probably the one of the best reviews that I went to um, or that I actually got to use. And um, his, uh, you know, his, simplicity really, really works. Um, but then fast forward, you know, to July of 2019, I fail again, but this time I get all of the questions, all 265 questions. And at this point, I'm like, I want to say I had 20 minutes left on the test and I was only at question like 200. And I was just like, all right. So like now, now my vision is starting to like really close in on me. So like, I don't really get, ex you know, anxious or have anxiety like that, but my anxiety was like, I've never felt anxiety like that ever before in my life. Um, and so at that point I was just, I wasn't even reading the questions. I was just clicking all the way through. And I was just like, man, here we go. And then a couple of days or yeah, a couple of days later, got that back, failed again. Right. And then I think I like, right after I had failed, I had said, I know what I'm doing wrong but 
I think I said that self to kind of, I think I said that to myself to kind of psych myself out. But in reality, I still didn't know. I didn't feel like I had any guidance because school was just like, do this, you know, it's very task driven, do this, do this, do this. Um, and school goes so fast that sometimes it feels like you can't really absorb the content. So, you know, fast forward to, I want to say September of 2019, this is on my third go. And then I get 106 questions and then I fail again. So at this point, I literally like have a come to Jesus moment and realize like, man, what am I doing wrong? What am I doing wrong? Um, and so then at this point, this is when I run into a, uh, one of the nurses who I work with. Uh, he's, uh, he was, he's still my mentor to this day. And uh, he was an ICU nurse. Uh, he was in the army and the Navy combined time of 25 years of service. And I had asked him or I had let him know like, hey, sir, I, you know, do you have any recommendations? in regards to like what the study for NCLEX and he had no idea that I was a nurse he had no idea I had I, I was a whole nurse not even a whole nurse but a, you know a whole graduate nurse uh and he would <laughs> and he was like wait a minute you're a nurse and then I th and then that's when our his and our relationship had evolved like from like right from jump and um he was telling me about Kaplan um, he wanted to look at my breakdown. He flat out told me, well, you aren't doing some shit right now, are you? And I was just like, well, I mean, you're right. <laughs> and so he kind of gave me a formula to, to, you know, to, to what I needed to do as in like, Hey, you're not doing this right. I know that you need to buckle down. You need to put yourself on a schedule. You need to manage your time. Biggest thing is that, you know, the, the, you have to, you have to do the, have the self fortitude to be like, and, and keep yourself accountable to where you are doing, but mostly like what you aren't doing. So he was just like, do you set up your room to look like, you know, the testing center? Do you have distractions as your significant other in the room? Like, do you have your phone? You know, just all those simple things that, you know, that if you go on, you know, Pearson view, it tells you like at, before the, or if you go on all these websites, it tells you like not to do these things. Um, so then he recommended Kaplan. I was using Kaplan and Mark Klimek because if, for those that don't understand or know about Mark Klimek, he has these very outdated audios, but the audios are still very relevant. They're still about 90% accurate, you know, with a couple of nuances in between there. So I was studying Kaplan, but then when I wasn't in front of a computer, I was listening to Mark Klimek. I was listening to Mark Klimek like he was the second coming of Jesus, like a gospel, like podcast every day I was listening to him on my way to work to and from work so on and so forth but then here's the kicker is that COVID had hit hard right and that forced us to stay home and at this point I'm an instructor we weren't doing any classes we had to stay home we had to telework so on and so forth so that was a huge huge blessing in disguise although of all of the you know, the terrible things that are happening with COVID or that happened with COVID around then and that are still happening. Um, that was a blessing in disguise for me because I got to stay home. I got to focus on studying and, you know, fast forward to June of 2020, I get there and this is when they only allowed 60, it was 60, I think to 125 or 30 questions at that point. And I did, it was an hour and five minutes and then my test shut off and then I passed. And then I had said to myself that if I pass my NCLEX this time, I'm gonna start a YouTube channel and I'm gonna start a YouTube channel. So I'm gonna start a YouTube channel because I don't want other people to feel how I felt. I wanna be able to <clears throat> put out that information to other people so they feel like they have somewhere that they can go or to where they feel like, you know, the information that they're getting is relevant, you know, to, to help them like on their nursing journey, either it be the day that the light bulb goes off and you say to yourself, hey, I want to be a nurse to when you start doing your prerequisites to the application process to nursing school in general, <clears throat> graduation to my biggest thing is the NCLEX. And then, you know, another big thing is, you know, applying for jobs uh, and then your first year as a new grad. Um, and that's essentially like kind of where I'm at right now uh, in my nursing journey to where, you know, I like to do this influencer thing. I like, I really enjoy it. I love talking to other people um, as well as, you know, I work as well. So, you know, I'm a ICU resident in a, in a medical ICU. Um, 
and it's taxing, very sensory overload. But um, I'm in my first year and your first year is the hardest. And, you know, I enjoy it. I mean, it is what it is, you know, but for the most part, I love the learning aspect of it. Um, and I enjoy it. I love for the most part. I love the people that I work with. Uh, and fun fact, I'm the only black dude on my unit. So, <laughs> so, you know, there's that. Um, but all in all, that's kind of how the journey started. And that's kind of where I'm at right now, you know? All right. But hey, hey, I didn't know you were going to tell your whole life story like that. But uh, I'm glad you shared it. Hey, <laughs> hey, that, 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 hey, that's great, man. That's great. Now, you was in the Navy, right? I was. I got mm -hmm. to start there. I was, right. How well, did you get... I'm sorry, not to cut you off. I am technically... There, there's no technically. I am still in the Navy. I'm just not active duty. I'm in the Navy Reserves now. Okay. Okay, you in the Navy Reserve. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So, you started out your story by saying you was a scrub tick right in the Navy. correct now you got to tell me to or you got to lead me to the circumstances that got you into the navy okay so <clears throat> now we're about to go back way back back in the time um hope i hope i hope the audience got that reference you know what i'm saying they, uh, they, they don't get got... that <laughs> am, am i showing my age right now um yeah, yeah. But um, I, my biggest thing is, I'm just going to say this flat out, is that if you're 18 years old or if you're a young, you know, lady or gentleman, um, you may not be ready for college. I'm just going to flat out say that because um, college is not for everybody. Uh, my nephew is 18 right now and he does not go to college. He has not been to college. He is doing a technical job in plumbing because he likes to work with his hands. And I'm just gonna tell you right now, that boy loves what he is doing and he is not in no student loan debt and he's not in nothing. Now, back to me, um, I was that 17, 16, 17, 18 year old kid that said I would never join nobody's military because what do I look like going to war to go fight for somebody, right? Because remember, I'm from Colleen. Colleen Fort Hood area is the largest army base in the world. So, you know, I wouldn't join it. I, I damn sure wouldn't join in nobody's army. Shout out to my army homies because I got a lot of them, but there was no way I was joining the, the army. If it was anything, I was going to join the Air Force or I was going to join the Navy. My grandma told me not to join the Marine Corps because my grandpa was in the Marines during Vietnam and she was just like, and she's from South Carolina. You know, that's where my family's from. And she flat out said it exactly like this. She's like, boy, you ain't going to nobody fucking Marine Corps. I'm just like, oh, okay. <laughs> I'm like, all right, granny, we ain't got to, we ain't got to go there. She's just like, all right now, you know, mm -hmm. hey, shout, hey, hey, shout out to my P. She ain't never going to listen to this, but I love her so much. Um, <laughs> but um, <clears throat> so I was 18, graduated. The day that I graduated, <clears throat> the day that I graduated, I felt lost. I had no direction. Like, because if you think about it, us as kids were institutionalized to go to school every single day. Right. And then the moment that you don't have to go to school, no one's forcing you. You ain't got to maintain attendance. You ain't got to do X, Y, and Z. The moment that you are not forced to go to school, you feel lost. It's kind of like when people come out of prison or they come out of jail and they have to go to a halfway house to be reintegrated back into society about how to do a job about or how to do a job, how to interview, how to do this, how to stay out of trouble. When I turned 18, I woke up the next day and I'm just like, what do I do? What do I do now? I don't have, I had a job at that point. I was, I applied for schools and there was one I was, there were a few that I was going to, or I was going to go to. And next thing you know, it was just like a day went by, two days went by and I'm just like, man, what am I going to do? And so I was just like, I'm going to go to college. Uh, I had already, I got accepted to one um, South Carolina state in Orangeburg and that's where I was going to go. Um, but even though I have family over there, actually, like, that's not where I'm from. And then I was going to go to that school, which is nowhere near my family. I think my well, my sister was going to that school in a graduate program at that point. But I tried to go there. I was there for about two weeks. I got really homesick. I felt lost. I didn't know what to do. I didn't have no support system besides her. And I was just like, you know what? I'm just going to go back home. So I went back home. 
Um, I applied for some scholarship, like a little academic scholarship, like $1,500 here and there. And it paid for me to go to my first year to community college. My first year of college um, was nothing like it was shown on MTV, VH1, BET, After Dark, whatever. Like <laughs> it, wasn't, it wasn't nothing like that. Nothing like uh, that. Nothing like that to where you're just like, hey, we're going to go party. We're going to go do this. We're going to do that. Now, don't get me wrong. Like there was people that was doing that, but then, you know, your grades started to reflect because you don't have anybody, you know, behind you telling you like, hey, you need to do this. Hey, you need to do this. Um, and so one day I was sitting on the couch doing some shit I wasn't supposed to be doing, hanging around the people I wasn't supposed to be hanging around with. And I get a call from a Navy recruiter. And he flat out says like, hey, you want to join the senior world? And I was just like, absolutely not. Click. <laughs> and so uh, uh, then he calls me back like a week later and he was just like, hey, so I'm looking for so-and-so. And I'm just like, and at this point, I was like, so I was doing stuff I wasn't supposed to be doing. I was higher than a kite. And he was just like, well, why don't you just come up here and talk to me? And I was just like, all right. So I went up there, talked to him. And it was a Friday. And for people that don't realize with recruiters, Friday, they work like half days or like non-existent days. They there for like an hour or two and they leave. I kept them fools there until four o'clock uh, in the afternoon. Um, but it really had sank into my head to the point I was just like, I'm 18. I have no direction. I don't know what to do. Um, you know, my, my dad was always telling me, you know, hey, join the military, yada, yada, yada. My friend's dad, would tell me to do the same thing. So I sat there, I talked to him, I listened to him and I considered it. So I took the weekend to think about it. And once I did that, you know, I, ta I talked to my dad and I talked to my friend's dad and they were just like, do it. There's like, do it your first enlistment or your first contract uh, because you know, you're just trying it. He's like, if you try it for four or five years, you will get more out of that four or five years than if you didn't do it. And I was just like, okay. Um, so I did it. And when I, when I, I joined the Navy at 18. Um, yeah, I joined the Navy at 18. No, I'm sorry. I joined the Navy at 19. And, um, once I joined the Navy, like I did, I didn't, I didn't look back at that point. The Navy slogan was to accelerate your life and boy, it accelerates your life. Like, because the, the, the level of responsibility and the level of growing up and how fast you have to grow up, um, they don't play. They don't play those games. Um, I don't regret joining the Navy at all. It's probably, if not the best decision I made in my life. And now here I am 14 years later. Yes. Okay. Hey, now, uh, you know, I'm glad you touched on that. Uh, the reason why you joined the Navy. Hey, um, my dad, he joined the Army Reserve. He told me, don't join the Army. He said, yeah, they don't do nothing but hey, crawl on the ground and get dirt on them. You, hey, you want to be in the Air Force. That's what he told me. That's what my so, dad told um, me, too. Oh, okay. Yeah, he okay. told me the same thing. Wanna... Nah, yeah, you ain't okay. the only one. You ain't the, <laughs> okay. you ain't the only one. All right. All right, then. So, um, hey, when you were making that transition, now, mm -hmm. I, I, I heard, you know, I heard some, um, some struggle in now. Uh, it was when you were making your transition from being a surgical tech to becoming a nurse, yeah. you know, tell me, tell me what, what was your biggest hurdle from your transition of, of Betty at the start of nursing school all the way to, you know, uh, graduate. Okay. Um, <clears throat> the biggest struggle that I had was unlearning everything that I had learned in the medical field. So I joined the Navy as a hospital corpsman. Hospital corpsmen are equivalent to unlicensed, um, unlicensed uh, LPNs. Um, because as a corpsman, we can push, we can give meds, we can, you know, we can suture, you know, we can do like the level of responsibility that you have a, has a, yeah, you have as a corpsman in a hospital and the even broader uh, responsibility that you have when you are uh, in the field, like if you're with a, uh, you know, Marine Corps unit or anything like that, uh, it is vast. Like, you know, you got corpsmen out there that are in the field that are pushing morphine, you know, and that's a nurse's job, not even an LV and LP. And that is a RN's job. 
but you got Corman that are out there that are that that hold that vast level of responsibility and it's and it's fabulous um and i love to see it shout out to all my Corman out there um so my biggest thing is uh the transition from enlisted medicine or technical medicine to nursing patient medicine um i was very i'm very very hard-headed sometimes to where you know i have a nurse that's trying to tell me like what is like what is right when i know that that's not right at all but i think what it was is the fact that i wasn't trying to be a student like i was trying to be the teacher because i was a teacher um there was one time i think one of the instructors was trying to tell me about uh sterile technique and everybody knows as a surgical tech sterile technique is your bread and butter and so i watched her put on sterile gloves incorrectly and i watched her open stuff up incorrectly and i'm just like that's not right and she's just like what do you mean that's not right but i went about it in the wrong way because i did it <laughs> I did it in front of everybody and, <laughs> and, and I wasn't the only one because there was another guy who was a surgical tech and he was just like, that's not right. And so, you know, that was a very, um, that was a very, uh, hard pill for me to swallow and to kind of like, you know, take back and just realize like, Hey, you're a student. Um, so my biggest struggles was, you know, unlearning what I learned as a corpsman and then unlearning what I learned as a surgical tech and then unlearning the real world versus the book world. So I had to unlearn all three of those things to reintegrate into the book because that is what nursing school teaches by and that is what the NCLEX goes by. So it took me a while to realize that. That was my biggest struggle out of all of that. Okay. All right, then. Now, um, <clears throat> that was your biggest struggle. Now, once you um, graduated from uh, from nursing school, mm. we have, we have already heard about your stru your unique struggles right. with the NCLEX. I'm I'm gonna go ahead and share my little story with that. I had um, I graduated in 2013, 2014. I got ready to take the NCLEX. Hey, you, you know what your boy said? Ah, oh, she, I got this. I got it. Mm -hmm. Hey, hey, I got mm. it. Hey. <laughs> They said, hey, I, it was a tough program I went through. Ah, oh, I'm good. I'd have graduated. I'm good. I ain't got to study. Of course, right. I flunked it. I can't remember <laughs> how many questions I took. I flunked it. Right. Hey, second time around, I took Kaplan. Mm -hmm. Second time around, I did all 265 just like you. Mm. Flunked it. That's right. That's right. That's yeah. right. Hey, came back the third time. Now, keep in mind now. When I took the test the first time, you know, I'm just, I got a girlfriend or whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, we just living life. After I, um, after I flunked it the first time, the next month, oh, she wound no pregnant. Come on now. Oh, no. Oh, 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 yeah. Hey, that, come on now. Mm -hmm. Hey, so it getting a little serious. Hey, I take it again in about June, July. Hey, flunk it again. Oh, man. Hey, it's your no serious. Nah, boy, you got, mm. hey, on, hey, you from down south. Boy, you got a baby on the way. And you ain't got no way to take care of. <laughs> hey, you ain't you ain't lying. Yeah, you know how you know how I go. Yeah, I do. So, hey, I finally I finally go ahead and uh I took it again in October. Baby came in September, mm -hmm. and um I I took it I took it again in, in uh, October. I I did the sounders. I, I did like a hundred questions when I was off and. I did right. like 200 when I was on. Uh, I mean, I did 200 questions when I was off of work. But when I worked, I did 100 questions a day. So that I think that, that would help me the most. And on uh, the third time I took it and then passed it. So, okay. but, uh, but, uh, hey, man, I, I just want to, um, you kind of touched on this with your job. Mm -hmm. how, how was your experience in nursing school being, uh, one of the few colors <laughs> um, <clears throat> you know it's crazy like somebody else asked me that same exact question um and for all those that don't know the statistics of the nursing profession the nursing profession is if the last time i checked it i want to say it's 89 percent women 
if if that if that's correct. If it's not 89, hey, I'm I'm sorry if the if the if I don't get the statistics right, but it's like in the mid to high 80s of women and then the rest are men. Well, you know, we'll stick with the 89. 89% women. 11% are men. Within that 11%, like 6 to or like I want to say 4 to 6% are white. And then the other like percent, I want to say like what 6% white, 3% black and then the rest and then like 1% other and then like less than 1% are or less uh, 1% is Hispanic and then the less is like other. So in my cohort, you know, in my graduating class of like, uh, like, I don't know, like 130 people, like 14 of them were men. And out of the 14 of them that were men, I want to say that I was maybe like one of three or four that were black. Uh, the other two that I know uh, right off top of my head were Hispanic <clears throat> and then the rest were white. And that's kind of how the statistics were. Now me going through school, um, I got like me going through school and going through clinicals and stuff like that. Like I got, I got a lot of love to be honest. Like the, I, I always like to, to label the girls that like, I had girls that were here in Houston, girls that were here in San Antonio. I had one girl in Dallas and then the rest of the girls were in Corpus Christi. And I would flat out like not segregate them, but I would be like, you know, those were those small groups that I was telling people about. And um, like they were great. Like they loved me because I was, I was always like, Hey, what are we doing? Hey, how are we doing this? I was very uh, engaged with, you know, making sure that, you know, Hey, if we got stuff done, so on and so forth. Um, but you know, like me going through school, like as not only a male, but a black guy, um, I didn't really have any issues. And I can tell you right now, like every floor that I went on, like all the nurses like loved me because they were just like, you know, we need more men in nursing. That's all, that's all I hear. And then, and then now where I work on my ICU, I like that is staff. So I'm core staff at this hospital. I am the only black guy that works in my ICU. There's another black guy. He's not staff. So he's a traveler, but he travels. He just stays locally, but he works in our neuro ICU and that's it. So between both ICUs, I am the only black guy and everybody pretty much loves me. So maybe except for one or two people, but I could care less about those two people. <laughs> okay. All right then. So, uh, hey, I, what I want to know is, uh, you know, you work in the ICU during this mm. pandemic. Right. I know you got some stories you would like to share pertaining to that. <sighs> Man. Um, first thing I'm going to say is let me, I'll just get this out of the way in regards to the COVID vaccine and what you guys hear on TV and what you guys see. Um, no, you're not. Come on with it. I don't ever want to hear somebody ever tell me that they did research um, because you truly don't know what research is. Um, I'll just give you an example. I don't even know what research is, but in my bachelor's degree program, they made us research. And when you start to get up in higher levels of education, you know, well, I'll just speak for nursing is like, you know, they want you to do evidence-based practice research. And so I, you know, if you're telling me that you're Googling something or you don't want the Fauci ouchie or whatever stupid shit that you're going to say to me, um, don't come up to me and tell me that you did your research. Um, it is your prerogative if you want to get the vaccine or not. Um, we, as, you know, as people in the United States, you know, there's a, there's a huge, you know, I say testing bank of individuals who, uh, you know, who have gotten the vaccine and they're showing that, you know, no crazy side effects, no this, that, and the third. But like mm -hmm. I said, but like I said, that's your choice whether or not you want to get it. However, just realize that you have a, you know, a not a good chance of living if you decide to not get it. Uh, and I will tell you why. Um, I have had both people in the ICU who have gotten the vaccine and who have not gotten the vaccine. Uh, and I can tell you more people 
in our ICU have passed away from not having the vaccine. We have also had people who have passed away who have gotten the vaccine, but more people have passed away who did not have the vaccine. Um, so like I said, I'm not gonna sit here and tell you what you can and can't do with your life. Um, but just know that there are opportunities out here for you to, you know, prolong your life, but that's up to you. Um, I do have a couple of stories. Um, I guess, uh, there was one guy that we, I legitimately was having a conversation with and he was COVID positive and he was, I was like, Hey sir, how you feeling? And he was just like, I feel okay. I was like, any problems breathing? You having any pain? And he was just like, no, he was just like, I do feel like, you know, I'm trying to get some air and X, Y, and Z. And I was like, okay, well, let's keep this BiPAP on you. So, you know, it's going to force that air in there, you know, so just let it do its thing. Don't, don't resist it. You know, just, you know, let it do its thing and let it put air into your body. And he was just like, okay. And then walk away. And then five minutes later, I'm at, a, I'm in another patient's room. And all I hear is, can we get some help in here, please? And we're like, what in the hell is happening? Walk around the corner and, you know, the patient's like wife is like frantic because he had stopped breathing. So then we coded him and when we coded him, got him back to life, all that good stuff. He got intubated. He was intubated for about a month. And for those that don't know, is like you can't be intubated for like longer than a week or two because then you start you know, introducing, you know, bacteria and you can get coat, you know, you get pneumonia and this, you can all, you're already going to have COVID pneumonia because that's what it brings on. And long story short, uh, he passed away uh, and he did not have his vaccine. So um, it's just saying that, you know, like life is short, you know, our life is our life as human beings is already short, you know, statistically, like, you know, we're not supposed to be here because of just, just the world in general. Um, but, um, just, uh, you know, take care, you know, take care of yourself. That's all I really got to say. And not just take care of yourself. If you're a nurse, make sure you guys are taking care of each other. Um, you know, a lot of people want to try to be out here and be rogue. And I never understood that. Like, I don't need any help X, Y, and Z, but I could tell you right now, I work nights and it's damn near like a skeleton crew. And we all lean on each other for everything. We walk past rooms if they're in there. Hey, how are you doing? Hey, are you okay? Hey, what you need for me to get you? Okay, you know. So, and like I said, I'm the only black guy on my on my floor, and I'm the only I'm the only guy that works at night. Mm -hmm. You know, and so you know they all come. Well, yeah, I'm the only guy that works at night, and we have another traveler. Uh, he works at night too, but I mean he's a traveler, you know. So, you know, as in you know core staff, that's me. But just take care take care of each other. Um, like I said, I got a lot of other stories that are out there. Like I can tell you about stories where, you know, a family came in there and was just like, you know, we're, we're going to put our faith in God. And I look at his, I look at his, you know, his monitor and he has an O2 saturation of 50 that has been like that for a week while he's on a vent with four chest tubes and a nitric of 20. And I'm just like, oh, okay. Um, but you know, if that is, if that is your faith and if that is what you believe in, um, then by all means, like I would never ever take that away from you. But, you know, sometimes it's the reality that, you know, us nurses and the physicians have to convey to the family, like it's not looking well for your family member. Um, and I want to say that's the hardest, um, the, the trend, the counter transference of emotions is a very, very, very real thing. Um, and I'll give you an example. We had a guy that got flown in um, from some small town out here in Texas, though, and he was a direct admit. So they brought him from the helicopter straight to the ICU. The moment they moved him from the bed, uh, the stretcher to the bed, he coded. And we proceeded to code this man and do chest compressions and give him medication for exact. It was exactly an hour. And the doctor was just like, okay, I'm going to call it. Uh, and he passed away before the family got there. And so the mm -hmm. family got there and it was in the room that I was right next to mine and need. And, and I had two guys that were on vents 
and you know the family goes in there and when i when i tell you that they they were wailing like it was like a very like wailing crying just like I, like as i talk about it right now i can feel it like i can feel it like in my in my whole like body and i can remember what it sounds like and i could hear the son crying he probably had to be about 15 or 16. um and i was just like hey can you watch my patients because i can't be over here um they were like are you okay and i was just like man I, i'm feel I, I i can feel their emotions in that room and i can't be in there and i've been to war so i understand you know like what that feels like um and granted like i hear people i hear a lot of people this is probably the thing that really irks me is i hear a lot of people compare covid to war covid is nothing like war um and don't compare it to war because believe it or not even though there's you know people that are passing away and you know like the world you know people don't know how to handle it go to war and then see how to handle that because it's nothing it's nothing close to that all right i'm getting all in my feelings right now but um <laughs> but yeah um yeah that countertransference of emotions is very very real so you know all i can tell the people is just take care of you take care of your patients as best as you can and take care of the family members as best as you can but all in all take care of yourself your mental health is worth more than anything trust me all right all right since you uh brought up mental health Hey, what do you do um, <clears throat> outside of your job to help balance, you know, your work life and your home life? Right. I drink. No, I don't. I'm just playing. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I do. <laughs> hey, look, there's like like my old instructor when I was in school, like he used to say, there's nothing wrong with partaking in a tasty adult beverage. There's nothing wrong with that. Mm. Now, your overindulgence in tasty adult beverages uh, can get you into trouble. That's right. That's um, right. so, um, I'm not a big drinker. Uh, like I said, when I came back from Afghanistan, you know, there's a lot of things that you kind of remember and, uh, and a lot of things, you know, people hold on to. And I always told myself I was never going to be a drinker and I'm, and I haven't like, I'm like, I'll drink socially, you know, every so often, but there's no alcohol in my house like at all. Mm -hmm. So I just, I'm just not a, I'm not a, I'm not a big fan. Um, but what I realized is that I, shifted my mindset to wanting to be happy and wanting to be successful and where I am. Um, the Navy kind of helped me lay that foundation. Uh, becoming a nurse increased that foundation. So what I do for my mental health right now is I talk to a counselor and let me just tell everyone, because I'm assuming that the majority of the community that listens to understanding the nursing game are black. So ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, let me let you know what's up. There is nothing wrong with talking to a therapist or a counselor about how you feel, period. Um, I talked to a counselor. I've been talking to counselors off and on for probably the past since like 2013 or 2014. I found one now who, you know, she listens to me she puts things in different perspective and it allows for me to see clarity. Um, I was beating myself up for years on just the things that I was doing and the decisions that I was making. Um, I went through a divorce last year or not last year, but in, you know, in 2020. And, you know, that really like, that really breaks a lot of people. And, you know, for a while it did, it broke me, you know, but I just didn't, you know, post it on social media for everybody to see. But, um, you know, I talked to somebody and it gave me clarity. I leaned, I leaned on people who have been there. You know, I don't go talk to, you know, my single friends that are just like, Hey bro, fuck her, blah, 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 blah. Like it ain't, it ain't like that. It's just, you know, it's just like, you gotta, you gotta find, you gotta find those people who have walked that line. That way they can give you, you know, their perspective. Um, but then all in all, you know, I chalk everything up to counseling. And counseling helped out a ton for me and it still helps now um positive mentors i hang around nothing but positive people and if i can't hang around positive people i will sit my ass in this house and i won't go nowhere mm -hmm. um video games regardless of what 
it whatever people used to say back in the day about how video games are destroying the youth's mind um you got more fools out here playing video games and making three four hundred times more money than the average person but yet hey video games is ruining people's life come on now hey making video games or the video game industry is a nine billion dollar organization so uh you know whatever hey go away baby boomers i don't know what y'all i don't know what y'all are talking about hey shout out to my grandma i love i love them both they're both baby boomers so <laughs> um but you know video games um this influencer stuff mentoring other you know you know younger service members and you know in all branches of the service um making youtube videos like i found out that editing it takes so much focus for me and i enjoy it because i start to think about little funny things that'll pop in between there like editing videos you know makes me happy you know like and i have a couple of other things that are coming up here in the next year that i'm super you know real excited for to where you know it you know it's going to change the game for me so it's just you know it's just a lot like I try to keep nothing but positivity. I, I like to watch a lot of comedy. So I like, you know, stand ups, you know, South Park. Like I got South Park playing in the background right now for no reason, just because it's there. Um, you know, I like to go to the gym, you know, like when they're open or, you know, I just like to do, I just like to, you know, to do something and keep myself positive because I don't have any room for that negativity. So find a niche in what you like, you know, entertainment wise. Um, that is positive and that will push you in a positive direction and go with it. That's what I would say. Okay. All right, then. So uh, <clears throat> now you work as an ICU nurse. Mm -hmm. Now, um, you know, five years from now, mm. if somebody was the, was the Evan, uh, ass of Kevin Gates, I mean, not, I mean, Kevin, Kevin, the boot nurse. Oh, I'll be Kevin know, Gates. Really? I tell you, baby, I tell you. <laughs> yeah oh uh, hey five years from now if, if somebody would say what you're gonna be you know what, what would you say as in like what i would do five years from now yeah five years from now you could write it out five twenty <sighs> twenty seven what is kevin the boot nurse what is he doing it's funny somebody else asked me that question two years ago well a year and a half ago Mm -hmm. Where do I see myself in a year, five years, or 10 years? I said a year, I would want to work in an ICU and I want to get my CCR in. In five years, I would have wanted to be a flight nurse. And then within 10 years, I would want to have my doctorate in nursing practice working as a CRNA. That has changed. How, yes, it has changed. Um, Oh, also in there, you know, becoming a, a commission officer, going active duty, and then retiring out of the Navy. Mm -hmm. But over the last six months, that has changed. Since I started working, that has changed. It was just like, it, it was, I was walking this line and it was very, very fine. Like I knew what I wanted to do. And then all of a sudden I came to a crossroad, but this crossroad had different roads. And I mean, it, it had to have been like five or six different roads to where something as simple as doing a podcast is something that was, that had jumped into my head or, you know, becoming an influencer full time or working remote or, you know, life altering, you know, situations like having a baby or, you know, like all these things popping up in your head. And so my original thought back when I had said that was like, that's what I'm going to do. But then now over the last six months, that's changed. So I really can't even tell you what I want to do because there's so many things that I don't know. Like, I don't even know like which one I would pull for first, if that makes sense. Like, it's just like, it's like, it's up in the cloud. And then it's like, whatever one I grab is like, oh, okay. You know, like I'll keep making informational videos for, you know, people on YouTube. Okay. I'll start a mentoring and mentoring and, uh, and leadership and consultant course or a coaching program. See what I'm saying? Like, it's just stuff like that. Or man, like I want to start my own Amazon 
company. You know what I'm saying? To where you can sell products through Amazon, like through Dropship. Or I want to really get into real estate. Or I want to understand what it's like to be a real estate investor. Or I want to be able to understand what it's like to to have my hand into stocks, crypto, um, uh, ETFs, index funds, like all of this stuff over the last like six months to six to eight months have flooded my mind to realize that I can be happy. And I, and it's like, it's like, I don't even want all the money. Like, it's just like, like regardless of whatever people think is just like how money is the root of all evil. It is, it is not because money can give you the freedom to do exactly what you want. Yeah. Right. Bro, people and I, say that. Bro, look, let me t- tell you, <laughs> if y'all listen, if y'all don't read books mm, come on and now. stay off of fucking social media, like TikTok and, and, and reels and all this stuff. Now, don't get me wrong. Those have their benefits. Like if you're going to use them for a specific reason, but mm-hmm. if y'all don't read books, y'all are slipping because people have been telling people how to make money for decades, for years. But then mm-hmm. you want to sit here and complain about why the man is keeping you down. So I'm going to give you a book. If you have not read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, if you have not read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, that is, should be in everybody's portfolio or library of books. Rich Dad, Poor Dad, Everyday Millionaire. If you don't understand that, you know, then I I don't know. I I don't know what to tell you. Uh, If you have not read, um, uh, there's another one called 444 by Ash Cash. If you ain't ever read that book, it talks about how to get out of, you know, financial, you know, debt and understanding your money. If you don't listen to the Earn Your Leisure podcast, then you have a problem. Then you need to understand that there is more money to be made out here than just nursing. As a matter of fact, like I was telling you earlier, there's a nurse that we, you know, we both follow her name is Kelsey with Whole Life Nurse. And she said that you are the CEO of your nursing license period so imagine that if you didn't have any nurses that listen to this you could have like we'll say you have an accountant or let's say you have somebody who is a a general contractor or somebody who's a plumber it's just like you are the ceo of the occupation that you do like you can go into business and do your i've seen so there's one dude who loved like one of the guys I worked with, I used to work with is all up in the barbecue. And now he has his own pit and he does his own stuff. And I want to say now he made YouTube videos with content. I think now he gets sponsored by like, uh, like people that make barbecue sauces like craft. Um, and I think now he's working on making his own, um, like barbecue, like, uh, like spatulas and forks and plates and stuff like that, you know, trying to get his Paula Dean on, you know, but he can say the N word and she can't, you know what I mean? So my bad, <laughs> but yeah, yes, hey, he gonna roll as he is. <laughs> that's what so. I'm saying. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, it's just like five, t- five years. I can't even tell you because it's just like, there's so much. But I can tell you right now, one thing that I am working on is a um, is a nurse coaching leadership, um, like consulting um, program for um, pre nurses. Um, yeah, for pre nurses, you know, doing their prerequisites for nursing students or nurses that are getting into nursing school. So they're trying to do the application process getting through nursing school, the NCLEX, which is by far my favorite. Um, and then, you know, doing stuff as a first year grad, like what to look out for, you know, like I even, I even have, you know, thoughts of like making videos about like, if you're going to go to clinicals, the things that you need, like the need to, the need to have rather than the nice to have. So it's just like, bro, like you don't need to have all these fancy ass things. Like if you just keep it, like, that's how you save your money. You know, if we're talking about, you know, the financial struggle of a nursing student, you know, it's just like, you know, you're living that dorm life and you ain't got no money. 
you know, but, and then you nine times out of 10 going to be out there with student loan debt. So I'm just trying to help you save money. So five years from now, man, I can't even tell you, but I can tell you by the end of this year, we're going to have some good stuff happening. Oh, okay. We're going to have some good stuff happening. Hey, that, that's good enough, man. That's good mm-hmm. enough. All right. For those that want to get into nursing, what's some advice you would give them? <clears throat> if you want to get into nursing, um, first thing that you should do is ask yourself why, like you have to, like, you have to have, like, what is your why? Um, in the Navy, when you're applying for any officer program, they want to know your why or your personal statement. Most of the time people will say, I want to make more money. Well, let me tell you right now, as a brand new nurse, <laughs> that ain't it. That is not it. Depending on where you work or I'm saying, depending on where you live and where you work, you don't get paid that. A lot of people think that, you know, you make all this nurse money because nurses are prestigious and X, Y, and Z. The nurses that are making all the money right now are the ones that are traveling and the ones that are doing crisis assignments and the ones that are essentially self-employed. Uh, but if you're working for an institution, like for a hospital or a university or, or a university program or whatever, those are the nurses that get paid the least. Um, so the hospital that I work at, they start you off at $25 an hour as a brand new nurse. Uh, There are nurses that have been at my same hospital for five years that make $30 an hour. And you can see the frustration for all the work and the responsibility that they have and how quick, uh, how quick an institute will throw you under the bus. And then you work so hard for $30 an hour. And then on top of that, when you see them fools take all, when you see the man take all them damn taxes from you, Lord, mm -mm mm-mm-mm. So first thing is like your why, like, I like to be that person that likes to draw out a timeline is okay. If I want to be a nurse, you know, that's great. But what am I going to do afterwards? Like the Navy has, has, um, has taught me how to be a nomad. I've never been at any command longer than three and a half to four years. And even in that, even in, you know, in that sense, it's, I would do different jobs in between there. So they, you would do one job for a year, have responsibility, another job, another, you know, another job after that year, responsibility, and then so on and so forth. And it's been like that for my entire career. And so I knew right off jump that nursing would be great for me to do bedside for three, for three to five years. But then I knew I was going to have to move up in some way, shape or form. Like, did I want to be a manager? Did I want to be a director? Um, So on and so forth. So if you're going to get into nursing, like, what is your why? Um, Second thing is that you have to realize that nursing is a marathon and it is not a sprint um the thing about people that sprint they get gassed um really really fast so you'll i'll give you an example one lady i was in nursing school with you know she was rude to everybody in the very first semester then we get to the second semester she failed out and she was accusing people cheating on tests and x y and z and she was just like i'm smarter than all of them yada 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 but she failed out the second semester and the rest of us graduated you know, mm-hmm. so it's like I said, it is a marathon. It is not a sprint. And nursing does not end when you graduate. And nursing does not end when you get your license. It doesn't end once you start working. Nursing is an ongoing, growing industry and it's consistent learning every day. So definitely, definitely know your why and then understand that it's a sprint. Uh, it is a marathon and not a sprint. Hey, I got you, man. Hey, I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah, good sound advice. That's hey, facts. Hey, damn right. Hey, let's go ahead and uh try to wrap this uh interview up, man. Yeah, hey, man. like you say, the analytics, like my my audience can only tolerate about forty five minutes to an hour <laughs> in my country behind. No, so, I hear you. Uh, hey, we gonna we gonna try to go ahead and wrap it up. But uh, what I'd like to uh end the interview with is uh, hey man, when you riding around. In San Antonio, late on the Friday night. What you listening to on your on your radio, man? Who your favorite music music artist? <clears throat> right now, I, I'm not even gonna lie to you. If that, if I'm not listening to an audio book, or if I'm not listening to a podcast, I'm not really listening to music. I kid you not. Like my whole perspective of what I put into my mind is a very, very, very big thing. Um, I mean, don't get me wrong. Like, you know, 
when 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 some new music come out you know i'll try to i'll try to listen to it um but it's just like it's the consistent thought of me wanting to not fill my mind with trash rather than you know fill it with something that's gonna you know help me significantly at one point but when i do listen to music um i do like pop smoke um you know rest in peace to him you know he was so young when he passed but you know like i like his music uh big sean i'm a big fan of big sean uh the baby that's my dude i don't care what nobody say uh <laughs> That's my dude. I mean, the way that he handled the way that he handled that one situation, and I really don't like to follow gossip like that. But the way that he handled that situation, I would have did that differently because I'm not real like in like putting my business out there like that. But um, I love the baby. I love his music. Um, and hey, but don't get it twisted. Like, don't get it twisted. I had a nurse one day, a long time ago, tell me you can really tell the caliber of somebody's character by the music that they listen to. So I like rock. I like Metallica. I like Avenged Sevenfold. Like, you know, like, and people are, people on the podcast are like, <gasps> no, but then, hey, you're going to have a bunch of people. I'm telling you, like, some of those things are acquired tastes. Like, I don't like, I'm not a big fan of reggae. I'm not. Mm -hmm. But I love reggaeton. You know what I'm saying? So I, I, I love it to, hey, put on some, hey, put on some reggaeton and then go downtown San Antonio to some, some of these bars and then see what's happening. You see what I'm saying? So I'm just saying. Just keeping it real. Uh, <laughs> but um, but yeah, like that's the kind of music that, to be honest. Oh, and of course, you know, Jay-Z. I honestly, these are the two songs that when I'm trying to recalibrate that I listen to. And it's and it's no lie. And me and my dad actually had a conversation about this one. But the story of OJ by Jay-Z. So one day me and my dad actually listened to that song and we were breaking it down. And so every so often when I, when I feel like I'm kind of drifting, I was just like, man, I, I need to be re I need to be re-educated and recalibrated right now. <laughs> so then I'll listen to it and then I, and I'll shake my head and I'm just like, mm. he was just like financial freedom. My only hope fuck living rich and dying broke. I bought some artwork for 1 million. Two years later, that shit were 2 million. Three years later, that shit were 8 million. I can't wait to get this shit to my children. I think it's bougie. Y'all think it's bougie. I'm like, that's fine, but I'm trying to put you on a million dollars worth of game for $9.99. Y'all better stop playing. Y'all better stop now. playing. So that one and um, uh, Middle Child by J. Cole. Oh, I love me some J. Cole too. Maybe he, he be putting it out. He be putting it out. Okay, then. Hey, man, I'm glad you said that Jay-Z reference because my, my uncle and I, mm -hmm. we always go back to that, uh, that, uh, that song and I ain't gonna lie. I um, I got my uh my uh my first Cadillac. Mm -hmm. My uncle was like, "Boy, you don't think you hey hey boy you <laughs> done made it? You done made? It. Come on now, you done, <laughs> you know right? Like, you know, uh huh. Cadillac, boy, you done made it, boy. Oh yeah. Boy, hey, I felt like I had made it. Then boy, the police pulled me over, and boy, I, hey, he reminded me, hey, you are black. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so don't hey, get, hey, do not get it will. twisted. That's why, yeah, don't, that's get why it twisted. don't get it twisted because I, I I drive around here just inconspicuous, minding my own business. I drive a truck, but then again, I live in Texas and everybody drive a truck. Right. Now, if I now if I ride around here like in a Caprice Classic with some 22s on it, then and don't get me wrong, hey, back in the day, I was all about getting me a Caprice Classic. I'm just saying. I was all about getting that Impala SS. Ooh. But then I was like, nah, I realized that, you know, we, you know, we right. have this, we we have this target on our back whether people want to believe it or not. And that's what my dad told me. You know, he was just like, you know, you're black and you're a man and you got to move different. And that's what I do. I move different. I move in silence. I leave folks, I leave folks alone and I do me. And they leave me to, and they leave me alone. I just, you know, that's just what I do. So. I got you. All right, man. Hey, what's some activities that you do for fun since this pandemic started? <sighs> to be honest, like um like during the summer i went to the pool a lot but there weren't a lot of weren't a lot of people there um i've been hanging out with family a little bit more um been catching up on some of these uh some of these shows like uh like the like uh what is it the boys on amazon uh i'm a big here's another thing i'm a huge anime fan like i love anime period i don't care what you say i don't care about how you feel because you want to know, hear something. You want to hear something about anime. Anime is written. Anime is written by adults 
for adults. Period. Like people don't realize, like they'll be like, hey, SpongeBob is annoying. I was like, yeah, but SpongeBob is written by adults for children, but it's written by adults. And there's a lot of like, but for anime, you know, in general, there's a lot of adult nuances that happen that people just don't even realize. Like my favorite anime right now is Attack on Titan. And I'm just going to leave it at that because I could talk about that all day. But uh, it adds it adds a lot of uh, historical and human nuances that people just don't realize when it comes to the struggle of life, when it comes to struggle of, uh, you know, decision making. That's a big one um, about, you know, the greater the greater good or individuality, you know, just stuff like that. Um, but watch a lot of anime, uh, like I said. I play a lot of games, but for the most part, man, I, I'm doing, a, I do a lot of research on like, you know, this coaching thing and, you know, courses and content because that, le- this, that is legitimately fun to me. Like just expanding my mind and learning other things. I watch a lot of YouTube. I don't even got cable. I just watch YouTube. And so like, if you don't subscribe to like the rich dad channel, uh, Ash cash, earn your leisure, uh, you know, I just have a whole bunch of YouTube channels that I just subscribe to and I just watch those through and through and it's great. Um, but I guess you could say <laughs> for most, like my life is kind of boring, but I think I'm, I'm in, I'm going to do that three to five year period to where, you know, I'm grinding and grinding. And then when I start living that laptop lifestyle and I have that cash flow, then you're going to see me in Miami, you know, on the beach, you know, doing my thing, or you're going to see me in, you know, in Italy, you know, doing my thing or Fiji or Bora Bora, wherever. And I'm just giving you this list because I got this list <laughs> of all these places I'm trying to go. Hey, I, I, I can believe, I can believe. Mm-hmm. Hey, you yeah. sound like a man with a sound vision. Oh. So hey, I, hey, everything you saying, hey, it's just a matter of time. You just give him the proper resources, it, it's That's gonna it. come to pass. That's it, man, it's growth. I'm all about growth. That's it. Like if you ain't trying to grow and you're just trying to stay stagnant, I ain't trying to grow like a weed. I'm just trying to go. I'm just trying to grow like a tree. Don't grow like a weed. Grow like a tree. Steady, solid, tall, and then branch out. That's it. Mm-hmm. You know? Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay, then. So uh, name one thing you would tell your younger self. <clears throat> that it's okay. Like, it's okay. You're okay. That's what I would tell my younger self. Okay. All right. So last question, man. Hey, mm-hmm. name one nurse that should be on my show. If you name them, you got to help me get them. Mm-hmm. One nurse that should be on your show. Oh, man. He would... Wait, you want to be... You wanted to be male or you wanted to be female? Because I know you all... I know we all about the ladies. You know what I'm saying? So... I it, it don't even matter. It's your choice, man. Your okay. choice. Okay. So I, I'm gonna try to just I'm gonna try to make this a little a little quick. So there's this guy when I first started out on YouTube, I was looking on YouTube to try to figure out what content to make. And not only was I trying to figure out what content to make, I was still trying to figure out a name. Like I wish I had my notebook right now, but I had like like five or six names that I was gonna go through. It was gonna be like the Navy nurse, the Corman nurse, just all kinds of stupid stuff, right? But then, you know, I stuck to the boot nurse because of what it represented for me and what other people thought it may represent to them. Um, and so then I came across um, two nurse. I'm gonna give you two nurses. Okay. I'm gonna give you two nurses. And yes, I will help you get them both. So, um, one was uh, when I was looking at travel nursing, her name is Carly Ray, right? And if you look her up, like even if you go in there, if you go in YouTube and you go on YouTube and put, I made $16,000 in two weeks. And in her name is Carly Ray. And I watched her video on how she made $16,000 in two weeks. And she was talking about strike nursing. So, you know, like these, these places up north, they go to into union strikes or whatever, but they still need nurses and these companies will pay them X amount of dollars for them to come up there until the strike is finished. Um, and then once they do that, and like they pay you and then you go on about your business. And so she did that and I saw that and then I started following her. Uh, but she's big, like um, she's big in doing like, uh, like hair and makeup and extensions. 
uh, also vlogs a little bit, but then tells you about like her nursing journey. She's an ER nurse. She talks about her experience about getting a BBL. Why everybody want to get a BBL? I ain't with it. But hey, she's from East Texas, honey. Listen, okay. She got that ex. She got that accent. She got that twang. So, like, I would definitely recommend her uh, to be on your podcast. Now, the other one is this guy I was just now telling you about, who um, I would actually like want to like link up with him at some point. But his name is called the Urban Nurse. And he is, uh, he was a nurse. He is a nurse. He's in, he's originally from Baltimore. And um, he talks about, he talked about his experiences uh, when he started nursing school, uh, how he bought his first house. And um, he talked about uh, when he went to New York, when the pandemic first broke out, um, he made a video. I want to say it's his most ranked or most uh, viewed video is his first nursing paycheck. And that gave me the idea to make a video about my first nursing paycheck. And I broke down my pay stub and all that stuff. Right. But, you know, he did that like three or four years ago. And I just did mine. Like, I don't know, like a couple of like maybe a month or two ago as a brand new nurse. And um, I figured I was just like, man, he's really onto something like that because most brand new nurses want to know what they're going to make. And um, I followed him, you know, listened to his, uh, his, uh, his blogs or whatever. I wanna say he has like 32,000 followers or subscribers. Uh, Carly Ray, she has like 60 something subscribers. Um, there's another one, she's a, I think she's a, a NICU nurse. Hers is the Nook nurse. Um, you know what I'm talking about? You know what I'm talking about? The I know exactly who yeah. she is. Uh, yeah, yeah. Hook, hook me over the new well, look, nurse. shit, like, I wish I could hook myself up with her. Like, oh, I, oh, okay. I was just wondering. I was like, like, shit, if I could get her, if I had a podcast, I would get her ass on there real quick. Um, But uh, those two, um, I would most definitely link up with. But the great thing about uh, about the Urban Nurse is that he flat out even said just recently that he is transitioning from telling people about nursing stuff to financial literacy for the black community. Because now he was just in Houston. He was just in Houston for, um, uh, for a, uh, a contract for, um, for a crisis assignment where he was making like eight, $10,000 a week. Yes, for y'all that don't realize that these nurses right now are making eight to $10,000 a week. So why would y'all ever be mad at them for leaving a hospital that's gonna pay them $25 an hour to, for them to get, you know, $800 a week. I mean, that, that like, you know, cause that math ain't math, you know what I'm saying? So, um, but those are the two, those are the two big ones that I would say to definitely, I would definitely say, Hey, check them out. Okay. Okay. Then, well, Hey man, um, Kevin, the boot nurse, if That's somebody me. wanted to reach out to you, mm-hmm. you know, how can they, uh, how can they reach you, man? What's your social media handles? So all of my social media handles, YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok. Yes, I have a TikTok now. Um, all of them are at the boot nurse and they all have the same picture, which is me, my smiling, beautiful face and my Navy uniform. <laughs> so that's how you know it's me. Um, I get a lot of messages on Instagram. I'm mostly on Instagram. So if anybody's looking to contact me, I am at all of those platforms uh, and I check them very regularly. So if anybody wants to, you know, link up with me or whatever, just that's where you can find me at the boot nurse, all those social media handles. All right, man. Hey, it's been a great interview. Hey, I, I'm going to be honest with you. You're not the first male out of interview. I had interviewed two others and, um, <laughs> And my uh my co-host, she interviewed me and all three males, me including, mm. we had our story to tell, so to speak. It bigger, it bigger had to uh say it, you know, I got a story to tell. Doom, doom, That's right. Doom, doom, That's it. Doom. So uh, you know, everybody got their own their own story to tell. Um it was great to hear yours. To be honest, you need a part two and a part three. <laughs> hey, if you want me to do a part two and a part three, man, you know where to find me, man. Just let me know. 
Okay. Hey, hey, hey. You ain't got to say that. I'm going to do it again then. Hey, we can do hey, it again. Because you, you know what? I'm, I'm going to tell you the truth. I'm thinking about doing a um a dating series, man. A dating series? Okay. Hey, dating a nurse. Dating an... Okay. All right. Okay. And uh, I had to ask a few, probably about five to seven different nurses, and all the all of them were female, of course. Right. And all of them they down. Okay. So you know, uh, to have a male on now, <laughs> it'll be uh, a different perspective. Right. Okay. I'm with it. So, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Right. So uh, you know, I keep you in mind. I keep you posted on that. Now yeah. we're just good for now. Yeah, we can do that. Just let me know what's up, man. Okay. Well, hey, uh, to everybody that's uh, tuning in, I want you to share this episode with your friends and family. And, hey, this has been another great episode on Understanding the Nursing Game Podcast.